Before I read, I want to introduce my editor, my day after day encouragement, and my most wonderful friend, Susan Rue. <laughs> I could not have done it without our laughter and fun together. Writing did not start early in my life. It started with a college night school course in Moline, classes at a senior center in Washington, D.C., where the professor urged me to publish. It took 15 years of night school to get my B.A. degree, seven years of running a self-service laundromat, and living all over the world with my marine husband. Finally, retirement. So here I am, two published books later. My first story I want to share with you is about my blind sister, Taurus. Life seemed easy for my nine-year-old sister, Taurus. Then in 1926, everything changed. Dolores had terrible headache. The doctors diagnosed a tumor on her optic nerve. The head surgeon said that she would either die on the operating table or survive in blindness. She survived. But everyone said it was a sad thing to happen to such a lovely, good, gentle little girl. When she looked at you with those long black lashes, Shading her blue-gray eyes, you felt as though she had peered into your soul. Through all the years that followed, through the happy and the unhappy, I remembered her like that. There were no accommodations in the public school at that time for blind children. Thirty miles away in the town of Batavia, there was an excellent school for the blind. But in order to attend, Dolores would have to live there. It was almost impossible for her to consider leaving home, home where she had learned to walk anew without suspense-filled fear of humiliation as she wandered into objects, her heart pounding when the inevitable crash came. In a new place among strangers, when other children woke after nightmares, and called for their mothers, she was alone. But school was a necessity, so we took her there, where she would start anew. She came home sometimes for the weekend on a local bus service. As the bus lumbered into the station, I would see her through the window, sitting alert and erect, waiting for the sound of my footsteps and my voice to take her home. We loved those weekends. Music became an integral part of Dolores' life in those years. Music sustained her for the first stumbling step of learning Braille and of learning to traverse the many halls and buildings of the school. But most of all, music helped her learn the mental attitude so vital to those who had tried, a, tried such a path. The piano puts its world a sound and touch gave fulfillment to her. The school concerts were her forte. When she sang, her voice was light and clear, with a flexibility of brain remarkable in one so young and slight of build. Her voice carried into the corners and edges of the room and surprised the listeners. So too, the concerts and operas Dolores and I attended together filled many void. We both saved allowances for our tickets. It did not matter that we had to sit at the back of the balcony. She could hear. Sometimes favorites, fortune favored us, and the music school gave free concerts for an entire week. Every afternoon and evening, at least two enthralled patrons sat in the audience. We would not plan anything else for that week. Music took precedence. As much as she loved music, there were other things in her life. 
She was a normal girl, and many things pleased her. Walking, movie, roller skating, even bowling and books. Dolores was an avid and incessant reader. The Al Albany Library for the Blind provide, provided her with a talking book machine, as well as braille books that she requested. But what thrilled her most was when I would read to her. We savored the summer vacation months when this was most possible. We took numerous trips to the library because we devoured books so rapidly. One summer, she decided we would read the entire works of Charles Dickens. I read hour after hour. If the weather was hot and there was no air conditioning at that time, there was always a clean sheet on the floor to lie on, which helped to keep us cool. We finished all of Charles Dickens' works so it took two summers to do it. I think she was actually sad when we completed them. Dolores loved to walk. I never ceased to marvel at the pace she would set for us, as well as the length of the route she chose. I never questioned her choice of location, though, because there were certain areas that she preferred. In her senior year of school, New York State wanted a representative from her school for the annual Apple Blossom Festival. Dolores was selected. Her eyes were still lovely as ever, and she made a beautiful queen of the festival. I still treasure the pictures taken that day among my favorite in my album. She graduated with honors. The whole family was delighted and celebrated with her. After graduation, she was fortunate enough to obtain a position which I, with IBM, which she held for nine years until IBM moved away from the area. She was a dictaphone operator. The dictaphone was the equipment, equipment mainly used at that period for recording letters and documents to be typed. IBM said there were rarely any errors in her transcription, and the company was willing to take her along when it moved away. But she chose not to leave Rochester. Later, the Catholic Charities hired her, and she held that position until she retired. Dolores loved that traveling with the family during those years. We traveled often, and we covered much of the United States States in Canada. When people asked her about her trips, she would always say, I saw. I often thought she saw more beauty than I did. But the early days of sharing concerts, reading, and other pleasures came to an end with talk of my plans for marriage and moving away because I would be marrying a career Marine. We have spent so many years and had so many adventures together that she must have felt, felt a loss. I was sure she cried when she was alone, but she never said anything to me about her heart. Life changed for both of us, and Dolores accepted it. Life would go on. I would like to read a poem from my book about my father, who committed suicide when I was a year old. My mother had died when I was seven months old. The death of my father put me and my siblings into foster care. So I wrote this poem for him. It's called The River. He loved her so. He had not expected this. Why had death made such a choice? It should not be. For others had a need of him, for five siblings and an infant small, a care forced to assume. His sleepless nights coped not. His love transcended death. 
a bicycle lay sprawled upon the bridge, and silently the river claimed its own. Now, a little bit of humor after that. My baby frog. One spring, I made a friend, a baby frog. Our family had a cottage on Confucius Lake near Rochester, and we used to spend some time there during our summer vacations from school. We loved to be there and like all children to look for bugs and little creatures of any kind. One day, Mother called us to lunch and I saw a great big bone on the table. Mother had made a macaroni salad, which was my favorite. Her salad was yum yum. I ran to the table to peer into the bowl. Right then the palm of my hand tickled, and I opened my fingers to scratch it, forgetting entirely that in my hand was my new friend, the baby frog. <laughs> With an enormous leap for such a small animal, the little green frog jumped into the salad. <laughs> he struggled in the bowl and rooted around, desperately trying to push himself up and up. His small leaps were futile as he grew more and more covered with mayonnaise. <laughs> Mother took one look and wow, was she angry. She grabbed that mayonnaise-covered frog who was by then stuck up to his eyeballs in salad <laughs> and marched to the door and flung him as far as she could. It was not my day. There went my frog and I bet you can guess. We had no salad. <laughs> <laughs> now this is an important poem. I met my good friend Claire Shaw here at the senior center. I want to read a poem she inspired. It's called Friends. Kindred spirits are we, defying age. Years not on the page, life too full for rage. A gift of wisdom down the years, in spite of laughter and some tears. No need for purple to advise, gray hair will suffice. Life is good and age defies. <laughs> I think I want to read one more. I hope you don't mind my taking up your time. I published my first book for my 90th birthday celebration. My second book, The Chair by the Window, was published in 2015 and is for sale here today. I am working toward publishing my third book this summer. For a little sample of what is in my third book, I will read the story, Rimsky. Rimsky is our cat. He belongs to the entire household, which he runs according to his prerogative. He is four years old. His color is orange and a fat cat. He is a remarkable looking cat because he was born with ears flattened to his head, a genetic condition of the Scottish fold breed. This does not impede his hearing as he misses nothing that goes on in the house. He is a very smart cat. Of course he is. He lets you know. When his food dishes need refilling, you will see him by the dishes with a meow. If food does not appear immediately, the meow is saying to her to a tremendous howl. He knows how to achieve attention. Rimsky loves Christmas. He lays on the DVD player by the window in the sun. He watches as the tree is set up in the stand and decorated. Now it is time for him to go into action. He saw the bells put at the back and bottom of that beautiful big tree. Perfect. He casually jumps off the DVD player and pads to the tree. He sees where the bells are located. A paw jerks, and the bells ring loud and clear. A parade back to his perch on the DVD player in the sun. Now it is time again. Rimsky repeats the procedure out of the sun to the tree, and bells ring. 
a few more times until he is ready for his morning nap. There will be time for more bell ringing tomorrow. Rimsky really does not care for movies to be played on his DVD clip. But Corey, right back there, in the household of carefully putting the movie into the player under the watchful eye of Rimsky, resting on top in the sun. There is no bell to ring like on the Christmas tree, but there is an eject button directly beneath this paw. <laughs> the paw shoots out the buttons pushing the DVD ejected from the machine. Corey, uh, Corey yells, complaining that he must locate the spot in the movie where, where Rimsky so rudely ejected it. There's fussing and fumbling, and finally Corey resumes the movie. Rimsky watches the process carefully until Corey is settled comfortably back on the couch. <laughs> then the paw shoots up. The movie ejected, causing more yelling and scrambling. <laughs> Two more times he repeats the game until Susan comes to the rescue. Rimsky is shoot to another room. And now Corey can happily watch the movie uninterrupted. <laughs> Thank you for coming. We have the book up here if you want to look at it. They're for sale. And then we've got some little refreshments as well. But feel free to stay and visit and talk with May. May will even autograph a book for you if you'd like. <laughs> and if you have questions about my sister or anything like that, I will happily tell you. We had wonderful times together. I Were you raised together then since? Well, um... When my father, or I was sent to what is called the SPCC, and I'm, I'm sure none of you know this. It's called the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And this was an organization that years ago was uh, in business. And they sent my sister Dolly, Dolores, and me to one family, Mother Sackett. And all I can say is, I was so fortunate. Excuse me. <laughs> I was with Mother Sackett from the time I was five years old until I was 15. She, they were like my parents. I mean, they did everything for me. When I wanted to tap dance, they provided the shoes for tap dancing. I was a clumsy little thing, but they didn't mind that. They put up with me, you know. And they were so good to me. And Daddy Sackett used to, now, I must say, being Catholic, Mother Sackett took the uh, uh, other kids to, school, uh, to church on Sunday. And I didn't have to go because I hadn't made my first communion. So I didn't have to go to church. Daddy Sackett and I went to the drugstore in the first place, and what we did was we bought penny candy for me. <laughs> and then we would visit these friends of his. So I had a wonderful life. In spite of being a foster child, I wasn't, I was so lucky compared to when the foster children are nowadays. You know, they move them day after day. And those poor kids don't know where they're at. But I had the advantage of being with one family for many years. And as for traveling, ah, oh, Dolores loved it. And you know, it was she when she, when I say she said I saw. She really felt like that. And you know, she had been I had been sighted up to nine years old. So she had an idea of, col of colors and people, and so that helped a lot. But she loved traveling, and all of us, the whole family, no matter where we went, Dolores went with us. She and she, she was good. You could take her anywhere. 
Was she older or younger? She was three years older. Yeah. And the rest of my family, they were hither and yon, you know, they took, they each, all of them got jobs and became successful. We were very fortunate for foster children. You know, a lot of foster children don't have the love and the attention that we had. And all I can say is, I wish it were different nowadays, that foster children were really loved and not sent from place to place. Now, I'm- I look at it up another way. You and your siblings must have been lovable. We must have been what? Lovable. Lovable, likable, likable. I think we were. <laughs> I know I was. Well, maybe they were. I know I was. I mean, how could you not love me? You know? <laughs> but, uh, and so modest. <laughs> yeah, it's so modest if I got to them. <laughs> and I remember I went to a Catholic school finally when I first year, uh, first three years of my life, of school life, I went to a little one-room schoolhouse. That's where I learned to read. How? By listening to everybody else read. Can you imagine I could read this? <laughs> yes, it was wonderful. And then we went into, oh, I must tell you, when I was in those first three grades, it was very diverse. We had blacks and Asians and us. And Nobody thought anything of it. It was wonderful. It was great. But then, of course, Daddy lost the farm, and so we moved into town. And things changed a little, but it was good. Where was this now? Rochester? Rochester, New York. New York. Mm -hmm. New York. Yeah. But you were still all able to stay together. You know, we couldn't stay together because Lars had to go to school, you know. And by that time, my sister Dolly was old enough to go to high school and begin working. So, so you, were the only one, you were the only one that stayed with the Sacketts when they moved to town? Yes. You were? Yeah. By that time, others were older. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Were you the youngest then? I was the youngest. And the best. <laughs> <laughs> Well, May, tell them the years difference between your sister Anne and you. Isn't there like 20 years oh, difference? 20 years difference. Yeah, 20 oh, years okay. difference between her oldest sibling is 20 years older than her. When my father died, she was 20 years older than I. So same same parents, everybody had the same mm -hmm. parents? Everybody had the same parents. Mm -hmm. What's the next age between you, there's you and then? Oh, there were of three years and then another three years. Of, they staggered them all. Yeah. And it was Anne and then there was a couple boys, right? Yes, there was Anne and there was Freddie mm -hmm. and Peter. Right. And then Dolly. Dolly. And Dolores. And, and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, the story makes it sound, when I write it, makes it sound as though I didn't have a good life. I had a wonderful life. I was so fortunate. I can't say enough for the life that I have had. And when I was 16, my older sister, my sister who was 20 years older, wanted me to come home, so I came home to live with them. And that was when I more or less took over the care of Dolores. And as I say, we had wonderful weekends together. We had a wonderful time. And I can't thank you enough for coming and you listening to me chatter out. <laughs> so when, so three coming out? I hope the middle of June. I hope by then. What, what are you dealing with? I gotta get Sue going too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what are you dealing with in the third book? I think more or less it's an anecdote. And the title of it, I think, is going to be, Sarah, What I See From Above. She's the one that suggested it. Mm -hmm. Yes, she suggested it. Yeah. We're working on that. Do you have any more questions? Yes. 
In about five years, could I get some writing lessons from you? Because I'll be retired by then. Because <laughs> I know you'll still be writing. Well, I'm going to try. You know, if I make it to 100, you're all invited. <laughs>